Hi everyone, Sharon here with Max Senior and another episode of On the Road. Today we're going to Eugene O'Neill's house in Danville, California, and that's the location where he wrote his most famous screenplay, A Long Day's Journey Into Night. And that script was supposed to stay locked in a vault until 20 years after his death, according to him. But 18 months later, his wife proclaimed, a wife has to eat, and she published it. I hope you'll enjoy going through the house with me and listening to the ranger tell this fascinating story about someone who lived in our time. When you call for an appointment, they tell you that the bus will pick you up in front of the museum in Danville on Railroad Avenue. And um, this is where the farmer's market is held on Saturdays uh, in Danville. So this is the bus stop. And it's a wonderful little shuttle that will pick you up and take you up into the hills because it's quite a distance. So here we are. I think I'm going to do two versions of this. Uh, I got a lot of what the ranger said, and I think I'm going to put all uh, 43 minutes or so of it up on YouTube and uh, do an edited version. So let's listen to the ranger. If you don't know, uh, it is a philosophical and religious tradition. It emphasizes living in harmony with the Tao. And in this case, the Tao is the source and driving force behind everything that exists. And if that seems a little vague, that's kind of too bad. Um, if I'm able to communicate the meaning of the Tao to you in any way, it's not the real Tao. You need to figure out that path that way in your own life. But the four Chinese characters Carlotta put up here on the front gate, Da Dao, Bei Shu, essentially what they translate to as Villa of the Great Dao. And of course, she's talking about her husband, Eugene O'Neill, because O'Neill was like the Dao in that from 1920 on, he was the source and driving force behind everything that had to do with theater. That means the way that plays were written as well as the way they were produced on stage. So we're here as part of the National Park Service, not only because Eugene O'Neill is America's greatest playwright, and certainly that's reason enough, but also in the way that he changed the way theater was written and performed into what we know as modern theater today. In fact, we consider Eugene O'Neill the father of modern American drama. Something else they wanted to include into Dao House was aspects of feng shui. Feng shui means wind and water in Chinese. It's the placement of things to bring about good fortune or dispel bad fortune. In this case, they actually painted the terracotta roof black. Black is a shielding color in Asian culture, so it's blocking that bad chi, that bad energy from getting into the house. And it's the same with the front gate. It's black to block that bad chi, that bad energy from coming in and disturbing the mass. trunk house. It's where they kept their 18 Louis Vuitton trunks for traveling. <laughs> that. The front door here, like all the doors in the house, are painted red. And red is a symbol of good fortune in Asian culture, so of course they wanted nothing but good fortune coming into the house. And if bad fortune has followed you this far, we still have one more right turn to make. <laughs> How you change theater is if one had gone to the theater before 1920, one would have seen this huge melodramatic production. It would have been completely orchestrated, very elaborate stage settings, you know, there would have been a damsel in distress that needed rescuing. There would have been a couple of sword fights. I mean, these are the kind of plays that your grandparents had been watching. Uh, things just hadn't changed at all. And O'Neill changed all that by writing plays that included hard truths. So that means he's writing about love and hate and family or the lack of those things. He's writing about sex, death, alcoholism, drug abuse, interracial relationships, all this in the teens, 20s, and 30s. Americans had never seen anything like that before, and it certainly got O'Neill censored in a lot of cities across the country. But you know, once people had seen an O'Neill play, they couldn't go back to that old melodramatic stuff. They just wanted more and more Eugene O'Neill. It's why that not long after he began his writing career, he did get his first Pulitzer Prize in 1920 for a short sea play he wrote. It was called Beyond the Horizon. O'Neill was a sailor in his young life. And he eventually had 51 plays written, but as I mentioned out front, it was the last three plays that he wrote here in the house 
that are his most famous and what are considered his best works, those plays are autobiographical in nature. They're about himself and his family and their trials and tribulations. And even if you haven't seen them, you might recognize those titles that I mentioned before. The Iceman Cometh, Long Day's Journey into Night, and A Moon for the Misbegotten. And what's unusual about the, these plays, you know, they are considered his best plays, but they were written long after he got the Nobel Prize for being the best playwright. So that lets you know how good they are and actually how important they are. You know, you can see here Mr. O'Neill, he collected masks. Uh, masks have a lot to do with early theater, the Greeks, the Romans. Uh, we've got Japanese no theater masks here, Chinese masks, African, Indonesian masks over there. Unfortunately, these are not O'Neill's masks. To get as close as to what he had, the National Park Service purchased these from the Andy Warhol estate. Um, he had a big connection with the arts and theater, and I guess he liked masks too. Something that is original in this room, it's that green mirror behind me. Uh, you know, it has nothing to do with feng shui. It's the end of the Art Deco era from the late 20s to the late 30s. Colored mirrors were a part of that, and Carlotta had a number of them in the house. I can tell you the Carlson family didn't like it that much. It is uh, odd, uh, to say the least. Uh, they took it out of here and they moved it down to the pool house. What they did, they built a small bar in front of it. But I really don't think drinking and looking at yourself on that is an improvement. Uh, according to friends and family, it was up here. We brought it up and sure enough, it's perfectly. Another touch of Carlotta in the house are the blue ceilings you'll see throughout the home. It's supposed to represent the celestial, the heavens. And then we have these beautiful terracotta tile floors representing the terrestrial, the earth, for yin yang, kind of tying it all together, considering we had the whole, or they had the whole home decorated with Asian style artifacts. I think we can all fit in the state park system. You know, there isn't a bad view of Mount Diablo from anywhere in the house or outside the house. And after the tour, I'll cut you loose and you can wander around out there. Uh, this room they called Rosie's room. They named it after the player piano that they had in here. Since O'Neill was a sailor in his young life, he did spend a lot of time in bars and bordellos. And the only form of musical entertainment in those places would have come from an electric Wurlitzer like this. And he talked about it so much. Carlotta had one shipped to their home in Georgia from a cat house in Louisiana. But she said it was painted a sickly pea green with no roses painted all over it. And like this one, it had stained glass in it, but it had roses in the stained glass. Uh, this, so this is not the original. But if you ever see one, let us know. Roses, <laughs> we're looking for it. A lot of photographs up here. Friends of the O'Neill's, writers, directors, actors, producers. There's even a poet and a professor. But the one picture I want to point out, there's a woman holding a black fan over there to the right uh, with the shiny dress on. That is Carlotta Monterey. That is Eugene O'Neill's wife. Uh, she was an actress, so that photograph would have been one of her PR shots she would have used to get a job. Uh, she and O'Neill, they were the same age. They were 41 when they were married. They were 49 when they moved into Dow House here. The other picture I want to show you is this gentleman in the oval behind you. Actually, all the men on that wall are that man in the oval. That is O'Neill's father, James O'Neill. Uh, he was a fairly famous actor from the late 19th century. He played many parts, but he found one he liked to play, and the public liked it even more. He played the part of Edmond Dantes in The Count of Monte Cristo. And in fact, the public loved him at it so much, he played that part over 6,000 times. But don't feel bad for James. He said he bought the rights to the play, and by 1885, he was making between 35 and $40,000 and staring out at the sea. So here he is on the left. He's about 10 in this photograph. 20 yes, he, he also has tuberculosis. And back then when you had TB, they put you in a sanatorium to recover, which they did. Uh, five months later, when he was better, they cut him loose, and he had a rebirth. He realized his life had been no good up to that point. And he said, I'm going to become an artist or nothing. And I believe it was probably all the time he had spent backstage with his brother, watching his father perform, that he must have realized that theater was in his blood, that he was gonna change things. He wasn't gonna become an actor, he was gonna become a writer and make it so that no one would have to sit through these long melodramatic plays again. <laughs> and that was exactly what he did, with one little exception. 
a play called The Iceman Cometh. That play is four hours in length, if you haven't seen it, and the whole play takes place in a furniture in the house. Is the O'Neills purchased essentially all the furniture from a store in San Francisco, which is still around. They're called Gumps. Uh, they specialize in Asian-style furniture, uh, but back then they had a policy that if you were going to move away or leave the area, they would buy back all that furniture from you. And that was exactly what they did from the O'Neills when they left here in 44. We were lucky enough to get one piece back, and that's his bed in the room above us, so we'll see that when we get upstairs. So none of this stuff behind the stanchions is original. Uh, not the carpet, couch, not even the blue mirror on the wall. The showsy screens behind you, they're not original. We have those copied of, uh, and made in China uh, from the ones that the O'Neills uh, had from photographs. Symbols on them. As the front gate, Da Dao Bei Shu, the O'Neills had left a whole fireplace set for the Carlsons, but the Carlsons didn't want a fireplace over there. They built a fireplace over here with the chimney on the outside of the house and they sealed that off. But we found those in the basement of the house. And then this huge recess, like all the recesses in the house, was for O'Neill's over 8,000 books. The writer's gotta have his books. Carlotta said it was like living in a library. But you know, the Carlsons, they didn't have 8,000 books. They wanted to look at Mount Diablo. So they put in a big picture window here, and the Park Service, what we do what we do best, we put it back the way that it was when O'Neill was here. And when we're doing this in historic homes around the country, we're going by written descriptions from friends or family members, maybe even the historic figure themselves. Or what's better than that, are photographs taken during the time period we're trying to represent. And that is exactly what we have here at Dow House. We've got pictures of O'Neill standing in the stairwell. We've got so we see the masks. We've got multiple pictures of them in Rosie's room. Over again by Life Magazine, when they came here in 1941, they had a plan to do an article on the O'Neills, but World War II happened and the article was shelved. But because we had some great photographs, we tried to make those rooms that we knew would look like as close as they could to how they looked in the photographs. Other rooms that you'll see that are empty, it's because we have no idea what they look like, and we're not trying to fool Was the fireplace the only heat uh, in the house? No, they have, they have forced oh. air heating. There's no air conditioning, but forced air heating. So here we are, the guest room. You would have had your own entrance or exit through these French doors here. You had your own watermelon colored bathroom right in there. You had your door out back so you could get down to the pool. Really the only reason you need to leave here was if you wanted to get something to eat and just serve the happy couple. Uh, original things in this room, it's actually these two paintings on the walls. These are Mountains of the Mist in China, artists unknown. We do know the Carlson family didn't like them that much and thank goodness they just didn't take a paint roller uh, to them. Uh, I knew the that they had a 10-year-old son when they moved in here. His name was Dick Carlson. I was lucky enough to speak to him uh, a few years ago. And he said when they moved in, what they did was they actually covered them up with plywood. And even for 22 years, they covered up with plywood. The house was essentially abandoned for about 10 years. When we got in, we uncovered them and found them essentially undamaged uh, after it became part of the National Park Service in 1976. So, pretty incredible. We're very lucky to have her. She here, she's about 16 years old in this photograph. And from what she says was happening when the photographer was there, uh, she said he was berating her. And if you can't see it in his face or her face or body language, maybe you can see it in his shadow <laughs> over here. He's berating her because she's living with her mother in New York City, but yet she's going out and she's being a socialite and a party girl and using the O'Neill name to do it. What he wanted to do, like most Americans, was something for the war effort. He wanted her to become a nurse. He wanted her to become a Rosie the Riveter. Uh, he said, anything, please. No, she said, I want to become an actress. I mean, she's quite beautiful. She's got the O'Neill name. I'm sure she had all her friends uh, telling her that. And it's hard to talk her out of that when you're in the business and you're married to an actress. Two years later, she does go to Hollywood. She returns and says, yeah, Dad, writes him a letter. I still want to become an actress. Oh, and guess what? I'm getting married. 
Anybody know who she married? Charlie Chaplin, that's right, the most famous, famous actor of the time. Something about Charlie you have to know, Charlie was very, 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 more than Mr. O'Neill can ever possibly be. Very, 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 am I getting it? Very, very wealthy, okay? He is also a notorious ladies' man in Hollywood. In fact, Uma said that Charlie confessed to her that by the time he was 50, he had slept with over 2,000 women. Yeah, and she still wanted to marry him. Well, those things were pretty common knowledge um, back then, but what really pushed Eugene O'Neill over the edge was that Charlie was the same age as him. They were both 53, and Una was 18. And he said, Una, if you marry Charlie, that is it. I'm gonna disown you. And then he thought about it some more. He said, you know what else? If you have any children with Charlie, they're cut off too. They're disowned. But you can look at that face and see <laughs> she did not care. Uh, she married Charlie, but you know, they must have really been in love. They were married for 34 years until his death, and they had eight children together. So I think Una finally got that large, happy, loving family she never had. So I say good for Una. When you think about it, very sad for Eugene O'Neill cutting himself off from his family like that, even from grandchildren that he didn't even have. Uh, very sad, very sad. You know, this house may look larger than it actually is. It's only um, a little over 1,500 square feet. It's because most of the house is just one room wide here, um, but it's pretty, you have to travel around and around. Even though it's that big, it only took him three months to build this house back in the day. Uh, O'Neill, he had $60,000 from the sale of their home in Georgia. He had $40,000 from the Nobel Prize after they spent a little more than $16,000 buying 156 acres up here uh, in Danville. Here's a man at the end of the American Depression with $84,000 to spend. Uh, you know there are many men in Danville and Alamo and San Ramon that are happy to work for Mr. O'Neill. And this house went up quick. Probably a lot less permits and inspections going on back then. So. <laughs> so she says she would have had these blinds drawn most of the time. Sometimes she even put up a curtain to block any incidental light. So kind of sad for her. She didn't get to look at that great view. She would not have had an overhead chandelier um, like that. That's a Mrs. Carlson edition. We're working on getting rid of that. The earliest photograph we have of Carlotta is right here, and this is where her name is Hazel Farsing. <laughs> Hazel is of Danish descent, but with dark hair and dark eyes, she could get away with calling herself Carlotta Monterey, and she did. Uh, so she was an actress, but the one of the views I read said her beauty outshone her acting ability. <laughs> <laughs> How O'Neill first saw her is he would stop by theaters where his plays were in production to see what the actors were doing, make sure they were doing it right, and he stopped by a theater that had his play called The Hairy Ape in it. Unfortunately, Carlotta was filling in for the female uh, lead that night, uh, and here she is in the white robes here. He said she was up on stage flitting about, uh, making up her own lines, not really what a playwright wants to see have happening with his play in New York City. Uh, he almost gets her fired. He doesn't see her for two more years. He's walking down the sidewalk in New York City. Carlotta and a friend are coming in the other direction. They meet, and he's introduced to Carlotta because, of course, he is a famous playwright and the man who almost got her fired. And she remembers looking at him and thinking, wow, this man needs some taken care of. Uh, why? Well, he's the famous playwright, but yet he looks like a bum. His clothes are all wrinkled and frumpy. She remembers he's got a hole in one of his socks. Well, the affair began. And not long after that, he leaves Agnes Bolton and Shane and Una, and he goes to France with Carlotta. And when his divorce with Agnes is finalized, he marries Carlotta in 1929 in Paris, and she becomes his third wife. 
Don't feel bad for Carlotta becoming O'Neill's third wife. Eugene was Carlotta's fourth husband, and she also had a daughter from her second husband who was living with her mother in Oakland. Oakland, that way. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and that might be another reason why they moved here to Danville. Uh, they had just put through the first Caldecott Tunnel in 36, so it made getting to Oakland a lot easier. You didn't have to go up and over the hills. And since they were older when they got married, this was their only baby together. This is Silver Dean Emblem O'Neill, or Blemmy, to his friends. He's a purebred Dalmatian that they got in London on their trip. And Gumps even built him his own bed. He <laughs> slept here in the room with Carlotta. And if you can't tell from the silk pillow and the way the banky is pulled up over his paw, he was a little spoiled. And I'm guessing that this picture was taken towards the end of his life because they moved the bed downstairs. You can see the tiles here. I know these purebreds have problems with their hips as they get older. And I bet coming up those steps would have been tough for him. When he passed away, it really broke them both up. But it broke up O'Neill so much, he actually sat down and he wrote the last will and testament of Silver Dean Emblem O'Neill. And I can tell you long before, I knew who Eugene O'Neill was when I was a little boy. I was reading that last will and testament in veterinary clinics around the country. Uh, my family, we had a lot of animals uh, in our family, and it was usually posted in the waiting room. Why? Well, it's written from the dog's point of view. So I'm kind of paraphrasing here. It says, thank you for being such a kind master and mistress. Don't worry about me and where I'm going. It'll always be mealtime, and the jackrabbits will never run too fast. <laughs> Don't worry about getting another dog, even though Dalmatians are the best. And there's a lot of other great advice in there from dogs to men, just trying to help people get over the loss of their loved pet. And Blemmy is buried here on site, out beyond the brown barn. His tombstone's out there. We have the last will and testament on a big old sign for you to read out there. We even sell copies in our visitor center. I've had visitors ask me to read it, but I don't need to see anybody cry. I'll let you do that. <laughs> even if the house is on fire. And staff had a problem with that rule, not because of the fire part, but once O'Neill began writing those last three plays, Iceman Come, Long Day's Journey Tonight, and A Moon for the Misbegotten, they are hearing a lot of yelling, screaming, crying coming from his study. And now we're going to have to walk us. Uh, it's supposed to be reminiscent of Funk. O'Neill uses Funk a lot in his plays. His characters like to talk about it. But you know, growing up in New London, he saw plenty of Funk. Working as a sailor. Even here in Danville, we get a lot of fog coming over the ridge here. Uh, so he gets a lot of fog up here. So fog was, believe it or not, safety, security. It was comfort to Eugene O'Neill. So being asleep in it, it was perfect. It was what he wanted. He did have a black mirror like that one. Uh, maybe even more unusual than the one downstairs. Uh, he did have a friend say, you're the most conceited man I know, uh, staring yourself in these mirrors all the time. And O'Neill said, no, I'm just trying to make sure I'm still there. <laughs> all deep like this. And he says, the fog was where I wanted to be. Halfway down the path, you can't see this house. You'd never know it was here or any of the other places down the avenue. I couldn't see but a few feet ahead. I didn't meet a soul. Everything looked and sounded unreal. Nothing was what it is. That's what I wanted, to be alone with myself in another world where truth is untrue and life can hide from itself. Out beyond the harbor where the road runs along the beach, I even lost the feeling of being on land. The fog and the sea seemed part of each other. It was like walking on the bottom of the sea, as if I had drowned long ago, as if I was a ghost belonging to the fog, and the fog was the ghost of the sea. It felt damn peaceful to be nothing more than a ghost within a ghost. So he is a ghost belonging to the fog in his own bedroom. Uh, very unusual. Uh, I can tell you, this is Eugene O'Neill's bed. Uh, this is a Chinese rat's bed. Um, it just has a thin rattan cover, like the old lawn furniture. It would have had a thin cotton mattress on top of it. They bought this bed from Gumps in 37, sold it back to them in 44. Gumps continually resold old furniture to new customers without any backstory. 
Uh, so by 1992, we certainly thought that all of O'Neill's furniture was long gone from Gums. But there was an actor working for Gums. It was his job to dust furniture. And when they clued him in that, yeah, this huge display table, because they put a sheet of glass on it with lamps and vases and tchotchkes on it, they said this was Eugene O'Neill's bed. And when he found that out, he let our friends group know. And they began a letter writing campaign with Gumps. Hello, we work with the National Park Service now. Could you please donate Eugene O'Neill's bed to us? We'd love to put it in Dow House, in his bedroom. We feel it belongs there. And it's certainly a nice sentiment, but Gump's response was, of course, goose egg. Well, it didn't take the foundation long to send out their tendrils into the acting world. And in May of 92, Gump's got a note from an actress in New York City. And it went like this. Dear Gump's, what can I give you that would pay you back for the bed you have, which belonged to Eugene O'Neill? I understand it was originally a Chinese opium table of carved teak. I know that they have already approached you and that you have not responded to any of their conversations. They are desperate. Can it mean that much to you? Think and be kind. You are Gumps. Signed, Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> Why Catherine? Catherine was in the first film production of Long Day's Journey Tonight. It's a 1962 black and white version. Uh, Catherine, of course, is playing O'Neill's morphine addicted mother. And if you were looking for a version of this play to rent, rent that one with Catherine Hepburn in it, and you will not be disappointed. Although I do need to warn you, uh, it can be difficult to watch. Um, Catherine is such a great actress. She's that saccharine sweet Catherine Hepburn you may know and love. And then she is mean as a snake to the family when she wants her morphine. And then she's all saccharine sweet and crazy. And then she's mean as a snake. And then she's saccharine sweet. And then she's mean as a snake. And she's saccharine sweet. And you just want her to stop, but she won't. She just keeps hammering away at it. And, well, <laughs> we're lucky that 30 years later, she helps us get Eugene O'Neill's bed back. So pretty incredible. We can all thank Catherine Hepburn. trying to make this room look like a ship's cabin. <laughs> you know, paneling on the wall, the beams on the ceiling. And for those of you who don't know, there is an old adage for sailors back on the East Coast, red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. So that's what that's supposed to be reminiscent of. And for a man who had three Pulitzers and a Nobel Prize, he didn't have any of that hanging on the walls here. What he did have hanging up, well, we have hanging up. It's his discharge certificate from the last ship that he worked on, the SS Philadelphia, as a sailor uh, for him. Other original things in here, those two ship models were his, as well as the Chinese junk model, Char his original there. one. Uh, there was a lawyer in Oakland that had the provenance to prove that it was O'Neill's desk and chair, and when he retired, he donated it to us. So just like the John Muir home or any national park site, that is dedicated to a writer, we feel super lucky to have these uh, historical artifacts uh, here in the house. Here's of their lives. They called it cycle play because you go to see the first play on the first night, the second on the second, the third on the third, all the way through 11 nights in a row. You have to be a dedicated playgoer, uh, <laughs> certainly. And O'Neill did not have the problems that most writers face. He doesn't know what writer's block is. He's not working on one play at a time. He's not working on two plays. He's working on all 11 at the same time. So he's writing them out, he's stacking them up, he's piling them up. He gets down over a million words on all of these plays and he wakes up one morning, nah, I don't want to do it anymore. And he saves two that are almost complete and burns the other nine in the fireplace behind you. He says, now I'm gonna write those plays that I need to write, that I have to write, and maybe my family will forgive me. Maybe I can forgive my family. Again, those three plays are The Iceman Cometh, Long Day's Journey Into Night, and A Moon for the Misbegotten. And when he finishes Long Day's Journey Into Night, he gives the original script to Carlotta on their 12th wedding anniversary here at Dow House, and he writes her a beautiful inscription in the beginning, which I'd like to read for you. It goes like this. Dearest, 
I give you the original script of this play of Old Sorrow, written in tears and blood. A sadly inappropriate gift, it would seem, for a day celebrating happiness, but you will understand. I mean it as a tribute to your love and tenderness, which gave me the faith in love that enabled me to face my death at last and write this play. Write it with deep pity and understanding and forgiveness for all the four haunted Tyrones. Tyrone is the last name of the family in the play. It's the one thing he did change. These 12 years, beloved one, have been a journey into light, into love. You know my gratitude and my love. Gene Downhouse, July 22nd, 1941. Now he tells Carlotta, you know this play is about my family. She says, of course, we've talked about it. And he says, well, you know what? It's the best play I've ever written, but I don't want this play ever produced on stage. What? <laughs> she can't believe it. Okay, she says, that's fine. He says, no, that's not all. I don't even want it published until after I've been dead for 20 years. <laughs> wow. Okay. Off it goes to Random House in New York City to sit in their vault and wait for that day. Uh, back here in California and the rest of the country, when World War II kicked in, the isolation that the couple sought up here at the top of the hill is kind of coming back to bite them. Uh, if you see, they're having a difficult time finding staff because as a woman, you know, you can make a lot more money over in the city of Richmond working for the Kaiser Shipyards as a Rosie the Riveter than the O'Neills could ever possibly pay you. And, of course, when they lost their chauffeur in 42 to the Marines, well, neither of them drove anymore. Uh, well, Carlotta said that she wouldn't ever get in the car again with O'Neill ever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was part of it. So everything had to be delivered up here. And gas rationing back then, very intense during the war. And then we also know the big reason why O'Neill and Carlotta left here. Uh, O'Neill was misdiagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Uh, he had tremors in his hands, in his legs. He said sometimes even his tongue would lock up and he wouldn't be able to speak. Uh, later on, they found out that it was not Parkinson's, but it was what's called an essential tremor. It's just one of those genetic things that just gets passed on uh, through your family. If you think about what Katherine Hepburn had, she had the exact same thing there. But you can see the degeneration which was occurring in his writing, 1913, 1920, 1940. And we haven't reduced it any. This is the original size that he was writing. And he said by 1940, he was putting about a thousand words on a single sheet of paper. How is he doing that? Well, what he's doing, he's holding on to his right hand with his left. He's pushing it across the page. And the words just had to keep getting smaller and smaller to control the tremors. I like how straight the lines are, but there's no way in heck you can read it. Uh, Carlotta certainly couldn't read it with her eye problems. She got her daughter, Cynthia, to come here from Oakland, read it with a magnifying glass, tell her what it said, and then she would type it up, get that typewritten copy to O'Neill, and then he would make the editorial changes on it, and then she would go back and type it up again and hopefully it was right then, and off to the editor it will go. I say at least the guy lived here in the house so she could say, you know, what's dot, squiggle, squiggle, squiggle? Oh, that's immediately. Oh, okay. All right. So it's a long <laughs> process, uh, getting his words to paper here. And with no one knowing how much longer the war is going to last, they do sell the home to the Carlsons in 44. They move to the Huntington Hotel in San Francisco to wait out the war. When the war's over... That's it. They give up on the West Coast. They go back to New York City for more hotel living. That's what the wealthy did. All of your needs are taken care of in a hotel. After a bit, they move up to Boston for more hotel living. And it was in that Boston hotel room in 1953 that he passes. It's pneumonia that eventually catches up to him. But of course, he had had tuberculosis. He had malaria. He's had problems with the essential tremor. Uh, and, of course, he had had his teenage brother taking him to bars and cat houses before he himself is even a teenager. So there's a lot of degeneration uh, going on in the back of the brain uh, there from early drinking. And his famous last words, I knew it, I knew it. Born in a hotel room and, God damn it, died in a hotel room and he was gone. Well, 
Carlotta, she was a great wife, but she did not wait 20 years. Uh, she waited 18 months. Her quote, Mrs. O'Neill has to eat, but believe me, she is by no means destitute uh, there. She goes to Random House and tries to take it from them, and they say, no, it's going to stay here for 20 years. That's what he wanted. Off to court they went, but you know. It only took that judge long enough to open up the front. Dearest, I give you the original script of this play. Well, that was easy, and he gave it to her. And she took it to Stockholm, and she had it produced on stage there to see if anybody might like it. Of course, they loved it. When it made it back to Broadway for the first time in 1956, Jason Robards Jr. was in that first Broadway production. Uh, he's also in the first film production with Katherine Hepburn. He plays Jamie the older alcoholic brother. He said on opening night, when the play finished, the curtain came down, cast assembled, curtain went up, and he said the whole audience was just sitting there looking at them. <laughs> they waited, they waited, they're thinking, wow, we were that bad, and they waited. He said, finally, someone in the back started to applaud. He said, then as actors, they saw something they had never seen before. He said the audience began applauding and they rushed the stage like a rock concert. <laughs> well, I believe the audience had never seen anything like this play before either. One has to imagine watching this intense play about family and when it finishes and the lights go down and you're sitting alone in your seat, you know you can't help but make the comparisons with your own family. Gee, my father's like that. Gee, my mother's like that. Gee, my brother's like that. So even though this play is about O'Neill's family, we can think of it as being about all families. It's probably why it's his most popular play today. And if there's one thing that you can take away with today here, take away with you today, think of it as this. Uh, Eugene O'Neill, he was our Shakespeare. He's the one that brought American playwriting to the forefront with American arts, music, literature. And, you know, we have no problems with letting the Bard of Avon be number one. That's fine. But really, in this country, it's Eugene O'Neill, even two other great American playwrights, Tennessee Williams and Arthur Miller, agreed. So it's good to know that they have his back. <laughs> and, you know, this is a good place for me as any to kind of finish the tour before we go down through the dining room and the kitchen and uh, visitor center and I cut you loose. But if you have any questions about anything you've seen along the way or anything in here, please uh, feel free to ask. changed out a lot of the tops to oh so modern for mica <laughs> i guess it was the granite of their of its day <laughs> and then here's the kitchen ago why it was in the basement and I said please tell me and he said my grandma had one just like this and he said when it was running it sounded like a jet engine <laughs> uh, so I think this early compressor up here uh, from the 30s was pretty noisy so out of sight out of mind over here we got a photograph of O'Neill and the chauffeur Herbert Freeman uh, Mr. Freeman his room was back here to the right it's not a very big room but it's what they gave the big guy at this point, um, his talk was pretty much over, and I wanted to go back and get a little bit more uh, video of uh, the kitchen, and I really needed to keep the people's faces out of it. And, um, and we were all kind of starting to get close together, so I have edited that out and just videotaped as much as I could. 
of the little room where it's the end of the tour and they have a lot of different photographs of uh, Eugene and uh, Carlotta and Blimmy, <laughs> their sweet Dalmatian. I think I need to move a little slower. Anyway, it was a wonderful adventure. I really enjoyed this tour. Um, very fascinating to see how they lived. So that's it for this long edition of Max Senior on the Road. I hope it's been interesting to you and I hope you'll come back for my next episode.